in this short video, you look at an application of double integral involving fast moments receptor neurons. So, in calculus, we look at objects of labs. Lamina is a template with causal difference. So, for example, a disk would be considered a lab or a square plate with constant thickness would be considered a lamina. And the top of the lamina could have any general geometric shape. Now, sometimes we say lamina. Really, we just need the top face of the lamina. For example, we might say a lamina is the shape of a quarter circle. In the top face would be a quarter circle. And then we have constant thickness. So in calculus, too, lamina's we study all have constant density. And in that case, we want to calculate the mass, but well, we just need to take the area and multiply times some constant, the area of the top, of course. But if the density varies at every point on the surface of the lamina, then we can calculate the mass using a double integral. I'm going to take a double integral of the density function over the region D. And the region D is the region corresponding to the top, to the top of the lamina. So let's look at an example. Top of a lamina is a triangle. It has vertices 0, 10, 5, 0, and 5, 10. The density is the square of the distance from the origin. In other words, the distance, the density of any point x comma y on the lamina is the square of the distance from x comma y to the origin. And we are asked to find the mass of the lamina. So let's take a look at what this lamina looks like. It's a triangle. We have vertices here at 0, 10, at 5, 0, and 5, 10. The density of any point there is the square of the distance. The square would be radical x squared plus y squared. So I'm sorry, that would be the distance. So we square that and we get that rho is x squared plus y squared. So let's perform this double integral. Now integrating over this triangle, I can look at it as a type 1 region where I have a top curve, y equals 10, and a bottom curve, y equals 10 minus 2x. So I'm going to find the antiderivative with respect to y first. Here's my density function, upper bound and lower bound. And then x varies from 0 to 5. So let's go ahead and evaluate this integral. Nothing challenging here. I'll anti-differentiate with respect to y. Uh, x squared is a constant, so I'll get x squared y. Antiderivative of y squared would be 1 third y cubed. Now I just have to evaluate that between 2 parentheses 5 minus x and 10. So Substituting the 10 in the place of y is not a challenge. Uh, then I need to substitute 2 parentheses 5 minus x in the place of y. Do some algebra to simplify that a bit. Now take the antiderivative with respect to x and evaluate that. Working all that out, I get not a nice number, but certainly a valid number. 26,875 over 12. That is the mass of that lamina. In Calc 2, we also talked about moments. So let's review that. 
the moment of a lamina about the x-axis, which we write as capital M sub x, measures the tendency of the lamina to rotate about the x-axis. And its formula is going to be, I'm going to take the double integral over d, and now I'm going to take the density and multiply it times y. y is the distance you can think of y. Take a point x comma y in the lamina, y is the distance from that point to the x-axis. And then we could have a moment about the y-axis, but now the distance from the y-axis to a point is going to be x. So with these formulas, we just have to remember that when I'm calculating m sub x, inside the integral, I'll be multiplying by y. And when I'm calculating m sub y, inside the integral, I'll be multiplying times x. More review of the center of mass. The center of mass of a lamina is kind of your balancing point where the lamina would not tip or rotate about any axis. So I would be able to, if I could put that lamina exactly at the tip of some fulcrum here, it would balance perfectly at that point. And the formula for finding the coordinates, so we call the x coordinate x bar, the y coordinate y bar for the center of mass, we just take the, to get x bar, we take the moment about the y axis and divide it by the mass. And to find y bar, we take the moment about the x axis and divide it by m. So again, we have this kind of uh, memory aid that when I'm trying to find the x coordinate, I need to use the moment about the y axis. And to find the y coordinate, I need to use the moment about the x axis. Let's look at an example where we find the center of mass. We have a lamina. Its shape is a half washer or half an annulus. It has an inner radius of one, outer radius of two, and the density is given as radical x squared plus y squared. That is, it's the distance from that point to the origin. And we'd like to find the mass in the center of mass. Well, what does this washer look like? This half washer, we're going to put it in the upper half plane to make the calculation simple. Inner radius is 1, outer radius is 2. Now, we have a polar region here. And our density has a nice expression in polar coordinates. So we're going to use polar coordinates. Now in polar coordinates, this is actually a polar rectangle. The radius goes from 1 to 2, and theta goes from 0 to pi. My density is r in polar coordinates, and the dA is r dr d theta. So that would just be r squared. The antiderivative would be 1 third r cubed. Evaluate that between. 0 and 2, and I'll get 7. Evaluate that antiderivative between 0 and pi, and I'll get 7 pi over 3. Now let's find the moments. Remember, moment about the x-axis, we have to multiply times y on the inside. And y in polar coordinates is r sine theta. So I had the r from the density r sine theta, that's how I get r squared sine theta, and I still have r dr d theta for my dA. So I would get an r cubed. Its antiderivative would be 1 fourth r to the power of fourth. The sine theta is just a constant when I'm taking the antiderivative with respect to r. So let's evaluate that. I'll get, what, 15? Uh, over 4 sine theta, the antiderivative of sine theta would be negative cosine theta, 
evaluate that between 0 and pi to get 15 over 2. All right, now the moment about the y-axis. I'm multiplying times x on the inside. x is r cosine theta in polar coordinates. So I'm going to perform a similar calculation here. I just need to take the antiderivative of cosine to get sine theta and sine of pi and sine of 0 is 0. So I'll get 0 for my moment about the y-axis. And so my center of mass, I'll take uh, for my x-coordinate, I'll take the moment about y divided by mass. For the y-coordinate, co I'll take the moment about the x-axis divided by the mass. And working that out, I'll get 0, 45 over 14 pi. Now, you may be asking yourself, because you remember in calculus 2, that we could have just looked at this and performed no calculation and say, oh, the x-coordinate of the center of mass must be 0, because that is a line of symmetry. But that's not the case. So a couple of words of caution. Even when you have a constant density, the center of mass does not actually have to be on the lamina. And when the density is not a constant function, the center of mass may not be on a line of symmetry. So we cannot just uh, avoid the calculations. We need to go ahead and uh, work it out before we can jump to the conclusion that, oh, because we have a line of symmetry, uh, then the uh, center of mass uh, must lie on that. When your uh, density is a constant function, the center of mass must lie on any line of symmetry that you have. And that's just simply not the case when the uh, density is not constant. You have to perform the calculation. All right, so here in our third example, uh, the surface of the lamina is the region inside one circle and outside the unit circle. And we'd like to find the center of mass if the density is inversely proportional to the distance to the origin. So I had a little mistake when I first wrote this up. Uh, I just wrote that is inversely proportional to the origin, which doesn't really make sense. We really meant the distance to the origin. All right, well, first of all, let's take a look at the other circle. We know about the unit circle, the center is at the origin, and we know that the radius is 1. What about x squared plus y squared equals 2y? Well, we'll subtract y from each side. And why do we do that? Because we want to complete the square. So I'll add 1 to each side. And now y squared minus 2y plus 1 can be factored as quantity y minus 1 squared, which tells me that the center of that circle is at 0, 1, and its radius is also 1. So the region that we're looking for is outside the unit circle, but inside this other circle centered at 0, 1. So let's go ahead and work on finding the mass. Now, this is a polar region. It's not a nice polar rectangle, but it is a polar region. And if we think about the uh, density, we're going to find that the we can express the density very easy or very easily in polar coordinates. So first, let's convert the equations of our circles. x squared plus y squared equals 2y in polar coordinates would be r squared equals 2r sine theta, or simply r equals 2 sine theta. As for the unit circle, that would just be r equals 1. So I'm going to have an outer curve, r equals 2 sine theta, and an inner curve, r equals 1. 
the density we say is inversely proportional to the distance from the point to the origin, but radical x squared plus y squared is just r. So it's just some proportional constant here, some constant of proportionality divided by r. So this should be relatively simple. Oh, but I need to know for my bounds on theta, I need to know these points of intersection, at least the angle. So let me go ahead and set these two equations equal to each other, which would give me sine theta equals one half, or theta is either going to be pi over six or five pi over six. So my integral for the mass, again, my outer curve is r equals two sine theta. And my inner curve is r equals one. So those are my bounds on r. And we just found that the theta goes from pi over six to five pi over six. Now our density is just k over r and dA is r dr d theta. So the r's are actually going to divide out here. So let's divide that out. The antiderivative of k with respect to r would just be kr. And I'll evaluate that between uh, 1 and 2 sine theta. I'll bring the k out in front. I'll take the antiderivative with respect to theta and perform the evaluation. And since I have to think about this carefully. Uh, cosine of 5 pi over 6 is going to be negative root 3 over 2. But then I'm multiplying it times negative 2. That's why I get the root 3. And then uh, cosine of pi over 6 is going to be root 3 over 2. We multiply that times negative 2, and I get the uh, negative radical 3. So working that out, I get this expression like constant k, and then in parentheses, 2 radical 3 minus 2 pi over 3. Let's look at the moments. The moment with respect to the x-axis is going to be, well, I need to take my y, which is r sine theta, times my rho, which was k over r, times my dA, which is r dr d theta. So that's going to simplify then. Again, one of the r's is going to divide out. Take the antiderivative, and I'll get 1 half r squared. So I'll bring the 1 half out in front along with the k. I'll have to evaluate that between 1 and 2 sine theta. So when I put in 2 sine theta in the place of r squared, I'll get 4 uh, sine cubed theta. That's after I multiply times the sine theta. And then uh, just putting 1 in the place of r squared, I'll just get sine theta. Now to evaluate this integral, I'm going to use an identity for sine squared theta. Sine squared theta is 1 minus cosine squared theta. Go ahead and remove the parentheses, collect the like terms. And then I just have in the first term, antiderivative of sine theta. And in the second term, that's just a u substitution, where u equals cosine of theta, du would be negative sine theta, d theta. So the antiderivative then will be a negative 3 cosine theta. That's the antiderivative of the first term. Antiderivative of the second term, I've got 4 thirds cosine cubed theta. And I have to evaluate that between pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. And so it gets a little complicated there, but after you work that out, it's actually just k times radical 3. Still need the moment with respect to y. So let's calculate that. Um, 
I would need to multiply x times rho dA, so x is r cosine theta in polar coordinates, still k over r for the density, and r dr to theta. So it'll be a similar calculation at the beginning to what we just did, but I'll get uh, for sine squared theta cosine theta minus cosine theta is my integral here. This will be a u substitution where u equals uh, sine of theta. So take the antiderivative there, and I'll have an expression that only involves sine and sine of pi pi over six is the same as sine of pi over six, so that will evaluate to zero. So again, here we have a shape that is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. It just turns out that, um, that our center of mass is going to be on the y-axis, but we couldn't take that for granted. We had to perform the calculation. So my uh, x bar is zero. My y bar is going to be more complicated. I have to take the uh, moment about the x-axis divided by the mass. The constant k is going to divide out. It will not appear in the center of mass. Let's look at a last example here. And it's a very simple shape. It's just a rectangle centered at the origin. So x goes from negative 2 to 2, and y goes from negative 1 to 1. The density has a simple function as well. It's just 10 plus x plus y. And we'd like to find the center of mass of this lamina. So there's not much of a challenge here in performing the integrals. We don't need to convert to any polar coordinates. Uh, we have constant bounds for our integrals. So working this out, I just chose arbitrarily to uh, take the antiderivative with respect to x first. And when I evaluate that, I wind up with a mass of 80. And let's find the moments then. Now the moment about the x-axis, remember I multiply times y on the inside, remove the parentheses, take the antiderivative with respect to x, evaluate that, take the antiderivative with respect to y, and evaluate that. And then the moment about the y-axis. We're going to multiply through by x, take its antiderivative, Evaluate that between negative 2 and 2. It's interesting because now the uh, y term uh, gets multiplied times x. When I take the antiderivative, I get half x squared. And since my bounds are opposite, that's going to evaluate to 0. So the 5x squared term and the 1 half x squared y term make no contribution after the evaluation. I just get the one-third x cubed term, and that gives me this constant 16 over 3. Take the antiderivative and evaluate it, and I'll get 32 over 3. Now, even though this is a simple shape, and it is symmetric about both the x-axis and the y-axis, neither the moment about the x-axis nor the moment about the y-axis is zero. So my center of mass has coordinates 2 over 15 for the x-coordinate and for the y-coordinate 1 over 30. So here's an example where I have a rectangle centered at the origin but its center of mass is not at the origin.